If you will, join me in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to speak to you about a message the Lord's laid on my heart for us. And, um, you know, every now and then, I, I don't claim to be um, a social theologian. And by that, I mean one of these preachers that just preaches on um, hot social issues of the day. I just, I focus on the Word of God and the things of God. And if it happens to hit a social issue, Oh, well, but um, this one certainly speaks to some of the things I think that we are, are facing in our modern culture here in America and even in the church uh, in America. But I want to read a passage from Deuteronomy chapter six. And um, while you're going there, this is a passage where God is getting ready to lead his people over the Jordan into the land that he promised them. And he tells them in the opening verses of this chapter, and I'm going to go down to verse 6 is where I want you to join me. But in the opening verses, he tells them these are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God uh, that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. God never intended for your faith to be a one generation faith. God didn't call me to salvation so that I can be saved. He wants me to pass something on to my children. He wants me to pass it on to my grandchildren. And so join me at verse six and I wanna read the word of God. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Now listen to the words he uses here. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up and when you go to the grocery store and when you're playing with your children and when you're going to work and coming home, talk about these things. You ever have a friend that won't shut up about the things of God? They're so on fire for the Lord and it's like, oh, we're going to talk about the Lord when we're around this person. That's the person God wants you to be. Verse eight, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Now listen, God's people took this way too literally so that they missed the point. They actually had these boxes that they would put scripture in and tie it to their forehead. There'd be a little box right here on their forehead. And, and Jesus had to deal with this. He said, you make your, your boxes, your phylacteries, you make them big so that people see you're taking my word literally. And he's like, no, I didn't mean that you literally tie it to your head. He said, I mean that you have it ever before you. And so he said, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And verse 10, he said, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, Wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, some translations read, when you have eaten and are full, then beware or be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, it's he who gave you all these things. And so I want to talk to you today on the subject that the Lord has laid on my heart, the blessing of hunger and the danger of being full. The blessing of hunger and the danger of being full. Lord, I thank you for your word and I pray that you'll help me to preach it and teach it so that even a child can understand it. 
and help the rest of us to catch on. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, and sanctify us by your word and by your spirit in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. You know, there is a danger in reaching a place in life that you are so blessed and so full that you're no longer hungry. Jesus when he was speaking in what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, he said to his listeners, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And I'm so thankful that I grew up in a family that is blessed. And... Um, we have been blessed in many ways as a family. And let me just say up front, blessings are not always in the form of money or material things. And we were taught that growing up. There were some times, some seasons in our life as a family that our family survived on prayer and faith and hard work. And we were taught that growing up too. We learned, my brother and I learned how to work hard. And, uh, but we came through some, some hard times uh, during some seasons of our life. There were times that we just didn't have much. And don't get me wrong, now, uh, my brother and I grew up with parents who wanted to give us more than what they had growing up. And they did that. They've done that. And I'm so thankful that they gave us more than they had growing up because I kind of appreciate indoor running water I kind of appreciate uh, having indoor plumbing and not having to go to the outhouse at three in the morning. Um, my parents have, have taken care of us. I'm so thankful that we've been blessed, but I'm thankful that there were times that we didn't have much to give. And I'm thankful that there were seasons of life where, and I'm gonna use a phrase here, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of the younger generation might go, what did he say? But there were seasons in our lives that, that we learned to pinch pennies. I remember my mother telling my brother and me, we're, we're, not, we're not gonna, now we're not gonna be chinchy, but we're not gonna splurge either. And I learned early on what chinchy means and what splurging means. And Tommy and I learned to pinch pennies. Um, and we learned that early. I'm so thankful that sometimes we had a lot, but I'm thankful that for those times that we didn't have much. And I'm thankful for having parents who talked about what we have and where it came from. I'm thankful that I grew up knowing where our blessings came from. We work hard and we do what we can, but it's God who gives us houses we didn't build and vineyards we didn't plant and wells we didn't dig. And it's, it's really the hand of God that blesses his people. And I'm glad they told us how God answers prayers when there seemed to be no way that we would make it. And he, they taught us about faith and they taught us where our blessings come from. They taught us to be thankful for our blessings. <clears throat> But, you know, one of the things I've noticed in the past few years, this world is telling the younger generation of today that you deserve to have things handed to you on a silver platter. In fact, there's a buzzword we hear so much about in our culture today, and it's the word privileged. Right? And, and so the message seems to be there's this emphasis that there are certain classes or cultures of people that are, are just simply more privileged than other people. And the world thinks that the answer to this is <clears throat> to punish you if you happen to belong to a particular class or culture or race or ethnicity that the world says is just privileged, we're gonna just punish you by taking away your privileges and we're just gonna give these privileges to people of another class 
or race or ethnicity or other cultures. You say, now, Pastor, be careful. You're just wandering off into dangerous waters right there. Well, I'll tell you why. It's sad to me that we have a generation of people in this, co in this country who don't even seem to know the difference anymore between privilege and blessing. Amen. And they seem to think that the answer is we ought to just give certain privileges to people who don't have them. And we aren't teaching them that, no, there's a difference between blessing and privilege, privilege and blessing, and where it comes from. One comes from the world and is man-made, but the other comes from God. From living a life of obedience to the commandments of God. God blesses obedience. And blessings are not always in the form of material things. Sometimes you just have God's favor on your life. Sometimes you're living in hard times, but with God's blessings, he provides. It just comes. He just makes it happen. He can make your car run longer without any problems, right? It's just where I was standing, Levi. So I want to talk to you about this. I used to teach um, in all the years I taught college classes and, and, and you know, I taught <clears throat> psychology and marriage in the family. I remember, you know, actually lecturing on some of this, um, particularly with regard to the social sciences and our following World War II. You know, Americans came home from World War II with this new passion for hearth and home, and they wanted to just make a home for themselves and have children and raise families. And during that time in our history, there was a mindset that emerged that uh, thought that the key to raising healthy children was to be able to give them everything they needed and most of what they wanted. And the idea was that if we could provide what we saw as the perfect environment, it would produce healthy, well-balanced, emotionally stable children who would grow up to be healthy, strong well-balanced, emotionally stable, productive adult members of society. Well, what we learned in social science is that the children who fared the best were not the ones who, who fared the best as adults. We learned that the children who fared best were not the ones who were given everything they needed or wanted. In fact, the children who came from the homes that were poorer, poorer, who didn't have all the perfect things growing up, the ones who seemed to grow up through hard times, those were the ones who seemed to be the most stable and well-balanced as adults. And the ones who had it all growing up, you know, just given to them, the ones that were, quote, privileged, they were the ones that grew up to have the most problems as adults. They, they were the ones who grew up to be, you know, alcoholics and couldn't keep it together and had the struggles, emotional struggles and upheavals. Those were the ones who seemed to do the worst. Now, isn't that interesting? <laughs> Studies have shown that sometimes the most stable people are the ones who came through the hard times and who know the difference between privilege and blessings. Those, those who know what it means to be blessed by God instead of privileged by culture and the world around us. There's a difference between blessings and privilege, privileges and which of those two we ought to desire the most makes a difference in our life. So I want to spend just a, about five minutes talking about the difference between privilege and blessing. You say, I thought you were already doing that. Well, I have, but I read to you this morning a warning in Deuteronomy 6. And it's a warning that God had given his people as they're about to receive the, the blessings of God of the promised land. He had told them, I'm going to lead you out of Egyptian slavery. Slavery, y'all. 
Talk about being underprivileged. He leads them through the wilderness for 40 years. And they're about to enter this land flowing with milk and honey. He described it as a blessed land. And I'm going to give it to you. But before they enter in, God knew that he needed to warn them about something because God, after all, knows the human heart better than we do. And God knew that there is a tendency in the human heart that when things are tough, when we're underprivileged, <laughs> we tend to turn heavily to God. I mean, if you want to see revival in church, let America go through a hard season. People will come to church like who'd have thought it. You won't even have to invite them. You won't have to offer them free gifts to come to church. They'll come out of desperation, out of hard times. But God knew that the human heart is such that when things are good and you're privileged, you might forget that those aren't privileges, those are blessings. And you might forget where they came from. I mean, all you have to do is read through the book of Judges to see that pattern. Things were going good, they didn't need God. Things turned bad, they cried out to God. And so God knew that he had to warn them. God knew that they might start confusing the concept of blessing with the concept of privilege. Now listen, a privilege is some kind of advantage or some special right that you have that is only available to a particular type of person or a particular group of people. It might be based on your race, the color of your skin, the socioeconomic status of your family and society. Privilege is a man-made thing. God, the Bible says, is no respecter of persons. God doesn't discriminate. God's not leaning more heavily toward one race or one ethnic group or one culture. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he died for mankind. It wasn't for red or white or black or yellow. I remember singing the song in children's, in my little children's class, that Jesus loves the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying privilege is something the world wants you to buy into. But now, you might think certain privileges are yours because of your parents' wealthiness. But God wanted his people to know that the good things that he would give them were not privileges, they were blessings. And so he said in verses 7 and 8, he reminded them, the Lord didn't set his affections on you or choose you because you were more numerous than other people, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept his promise. And he said, it's not because you're deserving of this, it's because God is the faithful God keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. I want you to know that I have blessings on my life. My children, my sons have blessings on their life because my great-grandparents served him. You say, what are you saying? I'm telling you, God is a God who keeps his faithfulness to generations of those who love him and serve him. A privilege is a special advantage or a right that belongs to a person or a group of people in particular just because you belong to that group of people. But this is a blessing and a blessing is something that's given to you from the hand of another. It's something you didn't earn. A blessing is something you don't deserve. And in the case of God's people, their blessings was because of God's favor and not for any other reason. And his favor and therefore his blessing was based on their obedience to the commandments of God. And that's why God said these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. 
God reminds them, I brought you out of the land of slavery and I'm bringing you to the land I swore to your fathers, a land that's large with flourishing cities that you didn't build, houses filled with good things that you didn't provide, wells you didn't dig, vineyards and olive groves you didn't plant. And he reminds them that all of these things are from God. It's God who blessed you. He reminded them, he explained to them, he said, I'm concerned that when I bless you, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, he said. All these blessings are because of God's favor and God's favor is on them because of obedience, right? Amen. So God warned his people again and again, and it goes on for several chapters. God tells them that if in spite of all this, you still won't listen to me and continue to be hostile toward me, he said, I'm gonna be angry. I heard a song the other day that said, there's nothing in God's heart but love. I said, no, that's not exactly true. Sometimes he gets angry. <laughs> he won't stop loving us, but he'll get angry. If we rebel against him, and God said, if you do that, then in my anger, I'll be hostile toward you. And I, I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over, he told them. I'll make their hearts so fearful in the land. This is what he told them in another place in Scripture. He said, I'll make your hearts so fearful in the lands of their enemies that the sound of a windblown leaf will put them to flight. See, when you don't have blessings, you can have privileges, but when you don't have blessings because of disobedience, you start to get afraid and you start to feel insecure and you start to, I think what I'm reading in scripture here might be a sort of a paranoia, an unrealistic distrust of others, an unrealistic feeling of being persecuted and fear. He said, even the sound of a windblown leaf is gonna make you jump with fear. There's a difference between blessings and privilege. And the message that this world has for people today, the, the world, it seems to be that, you know, those they deem as less privileged, what you really need is just more privilege given to you. You, you, don't, you don't need this world's privileges. I've come to tell you, you need God's blessings in your life. The world can't give you blessings. Blessings are from God. And this world would have you misunderstand the blessings of God in your life. The world wants you to think you should simply be one of the privileged people in society. And so if you're blessed, then this world wants you to think that you're just privileged and you don't deserve that. And I know better because I know where my blessings come from. There's a thing we hear a lot about called critical race theory that suggests that there are certain people who are just privileged because of systemic racism deeply ingrained in our culture that gives privileges to some and not to others. And churches have started embracing it. I, I recently heard a pastor preaching a message about it. And I thought, talk about false doctrine. Let me, let me just set this straight biblically. Let me talk to every race. Let me talk to every person in the world. Jesus Christ came into this earth and died for your sins because God wants to bless you. It's not about privilege. It's about obeying God's commands and living for the Lord and having the blessings of God poured out in your life regardless of what side of the railroad tracks you came from or where, how rich your parents were or who they were or what they had. I'm thankful for the seasons of life where we didn't have those blessings so much because it made us grow to appreciate the blessings when God poured them out. So let me speak for five minutes or so about remembering the hard times and what God has brought you through. 
God wants his people to remember these hard times and how God brought them through. And he uses some pretty strong language to explain to them the need to pass on certain things to the next generation. I'm concerned that we have a generation in our culture who don't know what it means to work hard for less than minimum wage. Amen. We think the answer is just to raise minimum wage. I remember growing up in a time where you didn't necessarily get minimum wage. You just got whatever they agreed to pay you. And you worked hard because you were, you were hungry. But listen to what God says. And listen to the words God uses concerning his commandments and decrees and instructions. In verse 7, he said, impress them. Impress them on your children. You mean I'm not supposed to give my child a, a say in this? You mean I'm supposed to make my children come to church? Well, if you don't, they won't when they grow up. God said, impress them on them. We had a way of impressing certain things on children. My parents impressed a few things on me on my backside growing up. And they, they, they left an indelible impression upon me. He said, talk about them all the time. He said, talk about them when you're sitting at home. We have families that don't sit around and talk anymore. We're busy doing this. I used to lecture at the college and when cell phones became popular, at first I wouldn't even allow them in my class. And then I realized, well, they're adults, they're gonna do what they want. But I did finally come up with a rule we could all agree to. If I see you doing this on your phone while I'm lecturing, you do not have a right to do this when I pause. Can you repeat that? We have families that don't sit around and talk. It's no wonder they don't know about what God brought mom and dad through and what God brought grandma and grandpa through. It's no wonder they don't understand the blessings of God. We don't talk about them. He said, I want you to talk about them when you're sitting at home. I want you to talk about them when you're going down the road. I want you to talk about them when you're putting your kids to bed at night. I want you to talk about them when you get them up in the morning before you send them to school. I want you to pray with them and tell them, God bless my son, bless my daughter. I'm sending them off into the world to school. I pray that you'll protect them and be a light to them and to their path. Talk about it. Impress it on them. You see, God knew he was about to bless them. He knew they were going to eat until they were full. And so they might not remember those days when they were hungry. So he said, I want you to talk about those years in the wilderness when you didn't plant crops and grow your own food. You got up every morning and God made manna come down from heaven. Talk about those times when quail just flew right into the camp, right in amongst your tents, and you ate all the quail you wanted until it came out your nose. It's in the Bible. Read it. You want to get your children's attention? Talk about that quail. They ate so much of it, it came out their nose. Talk about the way you didn't have any water and you had all these people and cattle and you didn't have any water and God just made water miraculously come from a rock. Talk about the hard times that God brought you through so that your children and grandchildren will know that it will be God who blesses you and not the world that gives you privileges. So he said, tell your children. I cause you to be hungry because I wanted to feed you with manna, because I wanted to teach you that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So I'm thankful for the hard times, and I remember. Some of you are going through hard times right now. 
And I just want to remind you, you need to know that those hard times will be your testimonies in the days of your blessings. And you need, to, you need to just thank God and go, I thank you, God, because I'm going to be telling stories one day to my kids and grandkids. And so lastly, I want to talk for just about five minutes about remembering the Lord your God in the good days of your blessings. I don't know what it is about our nature. It's our sin nature. But we just sure can be faithful and close to God when we're going through hard times. I mean, that's when we, that's when we pray the best prayers, isn't it? We get serious about praying. We'll, we'll dig into the Word of God looking for answers. But, you know, when things kind of smooth out for us, when we enter the land flowing with milk and honey, with houses we didn't build, wells we didn't dig, while we have a tendency to just forget about the Lord, I mean, let's just be honest. Some of us are way more faithful in the hard times than in the times when we are blessed. Did you know as a pastor, sometimes I pray, I pray for my sheep. When I see them starting to stray from God, Sometimes I'll pray, God, give them some hard times. You say, Pastor, you're not supposed to pray like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, we need God to lead us through valleys of shadows of death so that we can appreciate lying down in green pastures beside still waters. <laughs> and sometimes we're just more faithful in the hard times. We do our best praying in hard times. When we're hungry, we start to dig into the Bible. We look for words to stand on, promises to claim. But then when we pass through that season and enter into a season of blessing, we tend to forget. Church becomes optional. We slack up on our praying time. We might lay our Bible down a little too much. And so God spoke to them. And he said this to them, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells that you didn't dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, then when you eat and are satisfied, when you've eaten and are full, then beware, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out, who brought you through, and who blessed you with. He warns them again, further down, verse 12, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when, you, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. So I've come to remind you that there is really a blessing in hunger. And there really is a danger in being full. I am blessed. I am not privileged. And it's not because of my righteousness that I am blessed. And God made that clear. It's because of His goodness. It is in His mercy that He gives me, that, or in His mercy He does not give me what I deserve. In His grace He gives me what I do not deserve. You got the difference there? And I'm so thankful for his blessings in my life. And I want to pass on to the generations to come. I don't care what politicians say. I don't care what popular culture says. I want you to know that you, you don't need the privileges of this world. You need the blessings of God. And you get the blessings of God from your obedience 
to the Lord and remembering that it's God who blesses. Stay faithful to His Word, His commands, His decrees. And He'll bless us individually. He'll bless us as a nation. Amen? And if you're going through hard times, just hang on. God's just, He just wants you to remember the blessings that are coming. You got to remember those hard times to really appreciate these blessings and not forget Him. Don't forget Egypt. Don't forget the provision in the wilderness. Or you'll forget the Lord when you're blessed in the promised land. Right? Bow your heads. Lord, I pray for those who have heard this message and who are listening to me. I pray for those going through hard times, difficulties, difficult seasons. I pray that you will reveal your mighty hand in the difficult times. I pray, God, that you will help us to remember the hard times, the difficulties that you brought us through so that we will not forget you in the seasons of our blessings. Let us always beware of the blessing of hunger. Let us always beware of the danger of being full. And I pray, God, for the people who are full and forgetful, I pray that in your mercy, your severe mercies, that you will bring them through some hard times so that they will once again remember where their blessings come from, that they come from you. And I thank you for the blessings. May our generations to come know that they are from the hand of God through our obedience to the Word of God, the Holy Bible. Help us to stay humble through it all. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen.